All right. So thank you and welcome for joining us. My name is Daniel Stowell. I am the editor of the e-newsletter for IFTA. And today we have Bill Northey and Mark Rivett to talk about a special edition of the Journal of Family Psychotherapy that's now going to be called the International Journal of Systemic Therapy that they were able to, I guess, curate, be in charge in or however. And I wanted to give you guys a chance to talk about it. But first, since IFTA is sort of a varied context community of therapists and mental health practitioners from around the world, it's often helpful to hear about what people do. So I want to start off with what kind of mental health practitioner do you identify as and what does that look like in your context? So Mark, we'll start with you. Okay, so I'm a family therapist. I'm, um, in the UK, um, there are a number of titles that are used for that. One is family psychotherapist or family therapist or systemic psychotherapist. I, I prefer the family psychotherapist label. I work two days a week clinically in an eating disorder service for adolescents. Um, and I work two days a week teaching um, and the program lead at the University of Exeter teaching all of our breadth of systemic trainings. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist. Uh, I was the third one licensed in the state of Delaware. I got my master's and PhD in marriage and family therapy, and I've been practicing for over 30 years. Uh, currently, I am the president and CEO of a large behavioral health organization in the state of Delaware, where we serve about uh, 15,000 people a year with substance use disorders, mental health issues, um, families and children that are at risk of removal from their homes. Um, I still practice a little bit. I have a, a small private practice where I work with uh, uh, high conflict divorcing families around custody and visitation issues. Uh, and I also do some work around supervision. I still have a supervision group that I meet with uh, a couple times a month. And so that's about it. Wonderful. And that supervision piece is a good transition into what we're talking about today. So if the members have access to the journal, again, the new name is International Journal of Systemic Therapy. Um, so they can read your recent article called Editorial to the Special Issue of the Journal of Family Psychotherapy, International Approaches to Innovate uh, supervisory practice. So I love the long names. Uh, can you give the readers, or in this case, viewers, a taste of the article so that they can go and read more? Um, yeah, I think maybe it's a good place, Daniel, just to, to, to press the pause button on one level and just think about the different international perspectives on systemic supervision. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, that's what, the, uh, what we're exploring in, in the whole of the edition of the journal. And that's something that we we, we dig down into in our editorial. So um, here we have um, a US um, practitioner and we have a UK practitioner in the UK. Um, we have a very clear expectation that if you're a systemic supervisor, you have a systemic supervisor's qualification, okay? Um, there are our professional association lays down very clear guidelines about what that training looks like. It lays down very clear guidelines about what your supervisory CPD should look like every year as a as a registered supervisor of systemic practitioners um, in the us it's slightly different but i'm just going to hold on for a moment and just add something to that what what really interested bill and myself is that systemic supervisors supervise more people than systemic therapists mm that the practice of systemic supervision crosses disciplines, it crosses contexts, it crosses age groups. And what we thought when we looked at the literature on, on systemic supervision, on family therapy supervision, was that an awful lot of that experience was being missed. And we wanted to try to, to run a, a supervision stream that opened up the possibility for people to learn how to supervise across different contexts, different ages, etc. So that's kind of a, a bit of a context. Bill's now going to add his U.S. context. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the issue about um, the, the development of both supervisor and supervisee is one that's very interesting. I'm finding that I'm getting more and more supervisees who are in second careers. So they're my age um, and they're joining, you know, just learning to, how to do family therapy after, you know, having been in banking or in 
insurance or, you know, those types of things. Um, and they come with a, with a very different experience set um, than somebody who might have just come out of undergrad. Um, and I think a lot of times we tend to focus on sort of the, the, the newbie, um, both in a developmental stage and as in an ed educational stage where they are in their training. Um, and I, so, so I think as, as more and more people migrate into, into the profession, um, you know, I think as supervisors, we need to be thinking more about how people, um, how they come to the um, field and how the supervisor is going to interact um, with them in that process. I think you're hitting on a really uh, important point that you make in the article, which is that you've got this model of supervision from a scholastic perspective versus an apprentice perspective and different contexts, different countries, different um, places have emphasized them in different ways. How do you see that being um, uh, yet another lesson or, or tool for people to, to draw from? Well, I think the, the scholastic model, particularly in the U.S., is the, the pre predominant one. I mean, if you look at any of the literature, that's what it's focused on, you know, traditional sort of brick and mortar uh, programs where they usually have a clinic associated with them that they're, you know, able to do live supervision and do a lot of things that um, <clears throat> in other programs, and, and, you know, as we move to more online trainings, as we move to people, um, you know, uh, looking for their experiences outside of a, of a university clinic, I think it changes the, the dynamic and um, the expectations, but you know, Mark was talking about supervisors, supervi supervisors supervising people who may not be systemically trained. The other side is that that systemic trainees may end up with supervisors in their location that aren't systemically trained. And so, how do you adjust for those those contingencies um, that are, are are rather popular? Because there's just not enough uh, MFT and uh, supervisors in the U.S. I and mean, Mark can talk about what's going on in the U.K. But I think worldwide, there's not enough of us to go around. Hmm. And I guess the other um, uh, subtext in the whole issue is, is that very basic question, Daniel, what is systemic supervision? Um, uh, right. if, you, uh, if you look at the uh, scholastic courses on supervision, they rely on an awful lot of literature that isn't systemic. Mm -hmm. now, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It really doesn't. There's some fantastic textbooks around supervision that, which, that all supervisors should know. They should have them on their bookshelves, Daniel. Um, uh, but... Uh, the question is, what is, un what is different about a systemic approach to supervision um, that is different from, and, and, and Bill's mentioned that now, if you go to a supervisor who hasn't got a systemic perspective, um, because you haven't got one in your local locality that can give you that, um, how do you address that as a practitioner? How do you add the systemic twists, the systemic thinking to the work, to the, to the way you, 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 you take yourself to supervision and the way you expect your supervisor to work with you. So underneath the, 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 the whole issue is a question of what do systemic um, uh, supervisors bring to the supervision of anyone, yeah, which will be different from um, going to a psychodynamic uh, supervisor, a CBT supervisor, counseling supervisor. And I think that, that these are really crucial issues that our field hasn't yet really grasped, that, that again, most of the literature recommended in supervisory courses is generic supervision, alliance-based stuff, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, um, even, even stuff around self, um, what's unique about a systemic approach to the self of the therapist in supervision, which is different from how a counselor would manage that supervisory session. So these are, and, and actually what people will get from the issue is a, is a huge breadth creative ideas, person of the self, uh, person of the therapist ideas, um, ideas about using um, the IPSCOPE, the ideas about interaction, you know, they'll get a huge variety of, of tools from the systemic world they can bring into their supervisory practice. Thank you for bringing that up because I think one thing that a lot of supervisees don't know to ask is how do you do therapy or, or supervision? You know, even looking at models or philosophies of enacting leadership or, or apprenticeship or scholarship or whatever the, the model the supervisor uses. Now, because we are also in this new 
realm of everything's online. The very fact that we're doing this conversation is an outcropping of that. Um, how do you see the pandemic impacting the global supervision landscape? I mean, I think it, it's, it's turned everything, excuse me, upside down um, relative to the, the old ways, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've definitely um, ha uh, found that we can uh, successively do therapy and supervision online. Um, there are probably some contexts in where it's not ideal, and there's probably other contexts where, where it is better than the, um, uh, the in-person. Um, I, you know, I run the supervision group. It used to be in person um, and it shifted since the pandemic. I don't see a lot of uh, significant differences. You know, you're only seeing from the, you know, chest up, if you will. And, and so you may lose out on some of the, the nonverbals. But, you know, for me overall, I haven't seen a huge difference. I do think, and, and Mark probably speak to, to this as well, there are definitely different skills that you need in order to do, you know, both therapy and supervision effectively um, online, it, it, you know, engaging folks, particularly family members, um, if they're in the same room, um, you know, I, I don't think that it works very well if you have people several people in one room, you know, for a supervision process, <clears throat> and then some people online in, in that sort of hybrid model, I don't think it works, but I do think we we uh, we will will be learning more ways uh, to uh, effectively use uh, video um, for supervision and therapy going forward. Uh, I, I think um, uh, um, uh, Julia and Bill's paper in the, the edition addresses that really well and points out that that we are in a whole new world, Daniel, and, and our competencies need to get up to speed. Mm -hmm. that the competencies of supervising online are, are, there are more competencies supervising online than the, there are in the room, probably, yeah, almost certainly. And Bill's, Bill and Julia's paper is really good at demarcating what those potential additional competencies are that we all need to take into account. Um, but but as Bill says, what's it's fascinating that we, we um, we conceived this issue of, of the journal um, during a conference over, eight, well, 18 months ago, almost two years ago now, uh, before all of this happened. But all of, all of the papers in that uh, journal still have relevance now. Um, uh, there is um, a paper about creative drama therapy ideas and supervision. Uh, they, they can be used online uh, in a supervision group. I've used them online with a supervision group. Um, and, and actually, in a way, um, we're only limited by our imaginations mm. and our activity. That's all. The, uh, online is it can be just as creative and just as imaginative as as in the room face to face. Um, but there are additional things we need to know. We need to know how to work the the computer package. To start with. We need to know how to get the lighting sorted out. Those kind of things, yeah, um, which we don't need to worry about when we're in the room with people. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for giving us a taste of this issue and hopefully people can go access it. Before we end, what else either professionally or personally would you like our readers and viewers to know about you? Um, I would like everyone to know that Bill runs a supervision strand at the uh, IFTA conference almost every year <laughs> and it's brilliant. It's a great place to come to, to, to top up your supervisory practice. Um, and undoubtedly, as we, we know, there will be an online version almost certainly also coming up. I'm sure Bill will be thinking about that for the next conference. Um, um, and all, and um, if the IFTA conference is great for supervisors, it, it isn't just for people who, you know, there's, there's always a number of, of workshops and talks about supervision, and it's a great place to top up your practice and learn new skills. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that having the opportunity to meet with people from around the world. You know, we get our little myopic and we, we, we think of things in our own way. And then, you know, when Mark and I get to talk about things, when we've done the, the supervision track and hear from other people about, well, that's not the way it could work in there. So, you know, being open to that and, and trying to incorporate that into our work is, I, I think, something very important. Amazing. Yes. And whether or not we're able to gather in Japan in 2022, or wherever, yes, crossing as many fingers as possible. Um, it will certainly be another opportunity to, to gather, to learn, to grow, and to deepen our field. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today, and um, take care. Thank Bye. you for your